congratulations. <laughs> You've made it all the way through, and now we are really at our final conversation of the day. So please join me in welcoming Hugh Evans, CEO of the Global Pro Poverty Project, co-founder of the Global Citizen Festival, Michelle Nunn, president and CEO of CARE, with our very good friend and partner, Aaron Sherinian, Chief Communications Officer, United Nations Foundation. It's great to be here with the two of you. I gotta tell you, this is a little bit daunting. Why is that, Aaron? Well, we live in this era where we've been talking about movement making and something very new and very fresh and very different, and the two of you are right at the forefront of it. So we're gonna end tonight with a fireside chat. There's no fire, but you've kind of created a bit of a fire in, in the world around us, and so it's, it's good to be here with you at this, at this time. I'm gonna start out because you've seen your share of UN General Assembly weeks, right? right. You've, been, you've been to this party before, you've been to big multilateral moments, you've been to these things where diplomats from all around the world come in, but this one's a little bit different for a number of reasons. The two of you have done extraordinary things. I don't think there's been a lot of sleep over the last few days. Michelle, let's start with you. Help create the context for us. Why is this one different, and why is it different for, for care, and why is it different for you? And then, Hugh, we're gonna go with you to the same question. Great. Well, let me start by saying, how many of you all were at the concert yesterday, at the Global Citizen Concert? Yeah, raise your hands. So, can we give a round of applause to, to nah. you? <laughs> That's very sweet. <laughs> I, it, I, I think it was quite extraordinary to be there and to feel, I heard so many people say, this is a tipping point. Uh, and these are people that have been working in this field for some of them for many decades. Um, some of them are quite new, but a feeling that we had reached this inflection point. And I think the energy was, was palpable. And, uh, and so I, I do think we have to figure out how do we radiate this out and how do we sustain it? Uh, but, but I think the example that Hugh has set around taking, I was hearing stories of the early days of what <laughs> you, you were doing and thinking about how far this has come in such a short period of time, really to bring this work that I think has been going on for some time, but into the public consciousness, to really build a citizen movement. And, and that's what I feel like is different. I feel like we're on the cusp of something quite uh, powerful, but it is up to the people in this audience and those that you can communicate with to see if we can sustain that energy. How about you, Hugh? Why was this, why was this that tipping point? Why was it different? Well, I, I want to start by saying thank you for such kind remarks. That's very kind of you. And I think that it should be said up front that no movement, true movement, is about any individual. And I think that, um, you know, you, Aaron, have been a huge partner of ours this year, and I really want to thank you for that. And I uh, also want to acknowledge Richard Curtis, the amazing creative director of last night's festival, who did such an amazing job, as well as Chris Martin himself, who who brought the music together. Um, but for me, what made last night different was, I don't think our team has ever worked harder for anything in our whole life. I think, I, I haven't slept in the last two weeks oh, at yeah. all. Well, and uh, last night, Richard and I were in the editing truck till 7 a.m. this morning, still editing the one hour special for the BBC Worldwide distribution. And, and you know, we, we came out of it last night and Richard texted me this morning. He said, Hugh, I think that was the hardest night of my life. And uh, I think he's right because we pushed, everyone pushed themselves so hard this year to try to make the launch of the Global Goals something really special. And now the moment we've finished the day, the one question that we're grappling with and, and that I'm totally committed to is what does that lasting movement to achieve them look like? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the thing I'm committed to. I, I, Richard, and I, Richard and I had this creative tension this whole year where it was Richard's goal was make the goals famous, my goal was to build the lasting movement to achieve them and we came together in this beautiful unity between Project Everyone and Global Citizen that, that really made last night so special. So I think if you saw the creative, you saw the global goals represented in every which way but you also had a very clear and compelling either policy driven or global citizen driven call to action. And that is all about sustaining the movement because it's a 15 year journey. You know, Chris Martin joked last night when he was meeting with Prime Minister Solberg, he said, he said I'm gonna be 53, year, 53 years old by the time I finish this, this job. And uh, 
And, and she said, well, I'm actually 53 years old now, so it's all right. <laughs> and so, and so, so, uh, so she said, your, your life's not over at 53. So, and indeed it's not. And, and so I think that you know, we look ahead now with a great deal of eagerness about how do we grow, Global Citizen has grown to have six million members and, and when we've been turning on our, our drive of, of sustaining that movement, we're growing by about 300,000 members a month. So over the coming months, we're gonna to start to ramp that up. Mm -hmm. Our goal midway through next year is to have over 15 million Global Citizens, but ultimately those citizens, we have to do two things really well. We have to, one, help them um, to believe that they can individually make an impact because most people don't believe that. And secondly, we have to help them believe that ending extreme poverty is indeed possible based on the proof points that already exist. And once we do that, then we'll be able to connect them with our partner organizations like the UN Foundation, like the One Campaign, like Save the Children, like CARE, CARE has been an amazing partner and thank you for that. And thanks to David Ray and your whole team and Laurie Lee. Um, and I think once we do that, then, we're, then, the, then the global citizen meme will be much bigger than any organization because we don't want it to be an organization. We want it to be a true movement. Well then, if we're gonna talk about that second question, let's, you know, this is our, this is our time to have the honest conversation. Yeah. That second question, it's been lobbed at people. Yeah. How can you say you can do something that ambitious? How can you say you can do something that big? Guys, I wanna talk about, Let's, let's take it on, let's, there's an elephant in the room. Let's, let's, not in, let's not say that it's there, let's hug the elephant in the room for a minute. I'll, I'll it is a huge, huge thing. <laughs> How can you look people in the face and say we can get to the end of extreme poverty? And then Michelle, so Hugh, that's the first question for you. Right. Michelle, I want you to talk to us about measurement because we do have that 15 year window and care is in this. How do you measure those things? So Hugh, first to you, how can you look at someone and say you can get that done? Well, it's, I think there's two things to say on that. I think that if you look back at human history, even while I've been alive, when I was born, 52% of the world's population lived in extreme poverty. Now it's down to less than 20% of the world's population. Child mortality has halved since 1990. 84% increase in primary school attendance since 1990. You've seen 2.6 billion more people have access to clean drinking water since 1990. All that has happened while I've been alive. In fact, the last 20 years have been the most successful anti-poverty push in human history, so much so that more people have been lifted out of extreme poverty in the last 20 years than in the 200 years prior to that. And so it is possible based on human endeavor, based on the current technologies that exist, and based on the capacity to evoke political will. Now that brings me to the second point, because it won't happen unless we actually have that political will, but also the will from the private sector. And we can't take any of that as a given. And so I think that the change always has to occur from the bottom up and the top down, working together. Our goal at Global Citizen is to try to really focus on the bottom up and to try to reach those that are not yet here in the audience and connected with these issues those that tuned into the festival last night because they love Beyonce, and we want them, and she was awesome, wasn't she? Um, we want her to tune in because they love Malala as well. We want them to tune in because they love what Malala is saying about gender equality. We want them to tune in because they want to be passionately connected to these campaigns and organizations that they can have an impact in. And that's a pivot, and it takes time, because they have to trust the process of engagement. and so. So I don't take it as a given. I, I think that we have to believe that the best is yet to come. That last night's festival was just, you know, the tip of an iceberg of what we have to build if we actually want to look each other in the eyes and say we're going to end extreme poverty, because I don't think it's a given at all right now. There isn't enough political will. Yes, the vice president and the first lady was there, but the president himself wasn't. And so how are we going to actually ramp it up another notch in the year ahead? So when you're talking to me and saying this, I know you believe it. Absolutely. I, I'm hearing that you want a million, two million, millions of people to believe it. But they need to do that if they can see some of the data. You brought up some great data points. You're not that old, Hugh. You're a young guy. And so you've <laughs> seen those things in your life. Right. How do you measure it, Michelle? Because this is, these are life and death things. We're not talking about widgets and we're not talking about things that are in any way superficial. This is an authentic conversation about real lives. How do you measure impact? Yeah. 
Well, I, first of all, I do think that it's incredibly important to communicate the successes of the past. And uh, people need to believe in the efficacy and in our capacity to reach these goals. That's part of, I think, their uh, really building a movement that they are going to act upon. Uh, I th when, you, when you look at CARES work, for instance, we have very measurable and concrete ways of looking at our progress. Uh, first of all, CARE believes that one of the fundamental dimensions of meeting these goals is to ensure that women are empowered, that girls and women have equal rights. And, uh, and so you know, we have lots of ways of looking at that. How many girls are in school? Uh, we have, um, you know, 62 million girls that are not in school. We know what that means in terms of the future trajectory of those women, of those girls, of, of their children. And so, uh, you know, it's everything from that to looking at more complex measurements around their health care access for uh, sexual and reproductive health. And it's, first of all, are people getting the nourishment that they need? Do they have literally the, the, the nutrients that they need? And do we have equal access, for instance, for women to have the capacity for capital, for their to be own land? I mean, there's a complex set of things that need to happen around advocacy and policy change, around programmatic work, around private sector involvement. But we do know how to measure this, and we can hold ourselves uh, accountable and hold our institutions accountable and our collective efforts to meeting these goals. You know, one of the things that has come up as a theme during the Social Good Summit this year and in previous years and as the community engages all year long is this idea that we shouldn't be talking about people, right? Nothing, nothing about us without us, right? That's come up a lot. And you are people who aren't thinking about things that are far out there. You are well-traveled. You know these issues in the first person. In fact, you just came back from the border area of Syria. You have extreme, extremely interesting and extremely powerful voices, the two of you. There are some people that don't have the ability to get this message out to millions of people. Today, I'd like you to carry the voice for someone that you've met. Mm -hmm. I'd like you to be that voice for someone right now. Who have you met recently? And I, I, I don't want you to put on the spot because I know you just came back from the border area, but that is a, an issue we've got to talk about. Who do you need to voice for and what would they say? And Hugh, in your experience, because we're talking about issues that are very real, we're talking about things that are big and splashy, but you can be the voice for someone. So what would be that message of someone that you've met that you'd like to voice, Michelle, and then you? you. So a couple of weeks ago, I was in Jordan, uh, near the Syrian border. I sat with a family, a mother, and, uh, and she has four little boys and, and the father. Uh, they have no capacity to work in Jordan, so we need to keep in mind that there are four million refugees living in Jordan, in Turkey, and in Lebanon. 95% of the total Syrian refugee population is in those areas. And we need to continue to attend to those areas. But here's the story she told me. First of all, I asked her, why, why, did, you leave, uh, why did you leave Syria? What was it that precipitated your leaving? And she pulled her six-year-old little boy over, and she lifted up his shirt, and she showed me the shrapnel wound on his body. And he was bombed in his own home. She said, what choice did I have but to leave? So she then told me that uh, her children had perfect attendance at school in Syria. And then she said that my nine-year-old is now working, sweeping the floors in order to provide for our family. And my 14-year-old only comes home two days a week because he's working on a farm. So you have a 14-year-old and a nine-year-old who have no capacity to go to school, uh, a family that is not sure how they're going to get through the winter, and uh, we have a crisis that the global community has to respond to. And when I asked the, the question of what do you want me to take back to people in the United States, she said, and others said uh, as well, we need hope. We need to have a sense of hope and possibility. And that's our obligation, I think, is to give them a sense of hope by bearing witness, but also acting, telling our policymakers that we need to protect the Syrians from a humanitarian perspective, and that we need to attend to the needs, the most basic needs of these refugees who are trying to rebuild their homes and their families. Thank you for delivering that message. I think it's been delivered, so I think we heard we've got to deliver it. Hugh <laughs> from. From a global citizen perspective, what's, what's the message that you can voice and that this community can voice? Well, I mean, I, I think um, there, there was, while you were sharing that, Michelle, I think there was one thing that really hit me. Um, a couple weeks ago, we were in, we were in Delhi, and uh, 
we went to the outskirts into a community that was built on top of a, a garbage dump outside of Delhi. They were displaced after the Commonwealth Games because the Commonwealth Games came in. They were a temporary community. They were resettled out further in the outskirts of Delhi and, and were really the poorest of the poor. You know, I, we walked into, into this um, small shanty hut, middle of the day, you know, sun beating down and, and the room was full of thousands of flies where, where, where these where this, this amazing family, you know, lived every day. And, and, and this young girl who was pregnant at the age of, well, she'd already had two kids at the age of 15 years old, um, told us that, you know, we, we asked her, we, we, had, we had to ask her when there were no males present. So one of, one of our, uh, our friends who was actually works with the community, an amazing woman, she spoke to the girl and said, you know, without any m males present, because she was worried about how it would be perceived, what was your aspiration? And, her, and she said clearly her aspiration was to go to school, but she, she wouldn't have that chance anymore. And then we walked around the, we walked a bit further around the corner and we met a really contrasting situation where this family actually, ha, this, this amazing mother had three daughters and, and two of them had already completed their secondary education. One of them had already got into university, still in extreme poverty in the same community. And the, the other one was just talking about how, and this, I found this so telling, she said, she said, most people say that we're only allowed to have nine years of education, but I actually want to have a tertiary education. And I just, I was so inspired by that because I find that so often when we set policy from the ivory towers of the United Nations, it's, it's, uh, it's policy embedded in rhetoric around nine years and, and all kinds of rubbish like that, whereas, in reality, we know that, that, that you know, as Malala Yousafzai says so eloquently, you know, imagine if you were pulled out of school when you were 14 years old or 15 years old, just finished grade nine. Are you really going to have the quality of life that you and I take for granted? Of course not. And so I, I think there's a powerful message to be actually determined where policy is determined by what will actually empower people to live their full potential. And I think Malala says it so eloquently, those young girls in Delhi said it so eloquently, just through their own hopes and aspirations of completing tertiary education. So as we're building public policy and advocating for change, we have to advocate with that in mind. And, and, and if you think of just 12 years of education and a $39 billion challenge, when currently the Global Partnership for Education has raised $2.1 billion, you know, it's chalk and cheese. You know, it's literally miles apart. And so what's our legitimate pathway to get from 2.1 billion to 39 billion scaled up over the years ahead? That's not gonna be easy at all. It will be hard, grueling, and create competing narratives around public health and education because we know so much money is currently invested in public health. And so how do we as a community grapple with that? But also how do we get far more creative about where we mobilize resources from? Because we know with political and economic austerity, we know that Britain has maintained 0.7% despite their economic austerity. And the Netherlands has, you know, and, and, and Norway have, have maintained pretty decent levels, but Denmark has been challenged recently. So some of the leading donors in the world are struggling to keep up even with the existing demand, let alone where it could head. So is this a domestic resource mobilization challenge or are we actually talking about ODA still? Or are we talking about innovative finance? And if we don't, a line around what the policy implications of that are and advocate with a very clear narrative, then $39 billion just sounds like pie in the sky. You know, we can't fool ourselves. We have to be really clear about how we're advocating for change, what our targets are, and how we're going to achieve it. So I'm hearing from both of you that there's, there's hope, there's high levels of aspiration, but there's a real issue. There are real issues. I mean, you talked about how we're going to finance it, the issue about how are you going to get these things paid for, how are you going to get these things measured so that we know there's transparency and accountability this blend of you've got to make something big, you've got to have aspiration about it, but you've got to be realistic about the problem is something that, that we've heard from you. We've heard from, from this, this community and these movements. We're going to end with complete the phrase. Okay, are you ready for this? You know this 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 is like exercise. a game show. <laughs> it's, it's not a game show because I'm going to tell you how the story is. Last night, Central Park, a lot of you were there. Millions were there. Millions joined around the world. I'm on my way making sure that, that some, some folks that were there had the chance to, to join. And so I found myself walking out for a moment. Okay. 
And as I'm walking out for a moment, there were a bunch of people on the, on the margins of Central Park, and there was a little family. There was a dad with two little kids, and I was a little nostalgic. I was missing mine. And one of the two little kids asked the dad, hey, dad, what are they talking, because they heard the speeches, what are they talking about in there? And the shuffle happened, and I couldn't hear his answer. And I thought to myself, what's his answer? What are they talking about <laughs> in the Global Citizen Festival? So we're going to do complete the phrase. You were there. You made this happen. This is new. This is different. Complete the phrase for that little six-year-old girl. What are they talking about in there? Michelle, we're going to start with you. We're going to end with you, Hugh. What are they talking about in there? Uh, I think building a truly just world and eradicating extreme poverty. And I will add uh, giving everyone equal rights and equal opportunity. Thank you. Hugh? I think Michelle said it beautifully. I mean, my, my hope would be what they'd say is that all lives are created equal. And that it, given that all lives are created equal, we, if we act on that fact, then we act for justice, not just charity. Because we know that, as in the words of Nelson Mandela, overcoming poverty is not a gesture of charity, it's an act of justice. And that's what we're fighting for. Hugh, Michelle, we're with you. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you.